Good afternoon. Welcome to the Urban Transformations Lecture Series at Purdue. I know a lot of you may not be on campus, so welcome. We have a distinguished uh, speaker. It's my honor to introduce him. Andrea Rinaldo, uh, professor at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, as well as professor at Padua University uh, in, in Padua, Italy. So I'm wearing a t-shirt that has a logo, Padua logo, if Andrea hasn't appreciated I, that. I have one, so, <laughs> so in honor of you. There you go, Andrea. Oh, oh, lovely, yes. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> so I've, known, I've had the pleasure of working with and knowing Andrea for a long time. He's a world-renowned authority on many subjects and his degree, we are proud to say, PhD degree is from civil engineering, 1983. Since then, he's gone on to fame, including many honors. I'll list just three uh, here. He's a member of the National Academy of Science as well as National Academy of Engineering. And um, he is honored this year as the recipient of the Distinguished Engineering Alum at Purdue. Uh, we had a virtual ceremony recently, and he's also honored as the first cohort of Neil Armstrong, Distinguished Visiting Professor in Civil Engineering. And so he's visited Purdue several times, given a couple talks in the past, but he's agreed to give a special talk constructed only for this uh, lecture series. And Andrea, we are recording this and will be only available uh, for consumption on requests from Purdue colleagues. And with that, uh, the floor is yours, Andrea. Yes. So As I say, I, Zoom is yours. Start with, I've heard mine and I just set my alarm to make sure that I don't get carried away because of things I, I like quite a bit. And um, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Suresh. It's a great pleasure to to, to uh, have uh, the pleasure and an honor to, uh, to lecture to, to my fellow Purdue students. Uh, I'm a Boilermaker, as you heard, and probably so. And I'm glad uh, that uh, to Satish, uh, to Suresh, and to Gaia for, for making this possible. It's a pleasure to talk to you about. I give you my five cents about um, a few issues that um, are, are in fact stimulated by the discussion we had with uh, Suresh and Satish uh, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. So can you see my screen, first of all? Yes. OK. So that's uh, after some mumbling. That's uh, that's the title that I chose for you. It's called "Reflected in Water." It means uh, that uh, it's taken from it's a it's a somewhat if you want it's a tribute to Sandra Postel, who just got the Stockholm Water Prize, who writes beautifully well about the global water resources issues. And "Reflected in Water" means that it's, it's uh, reflected in something we can actually see from water. I'm a hydrologist. What I do for a living, I, I study eco-hydrology, that is uh, water controls on living communities, on biota in general. And uh, I'll try to uh, sell you, although I'm certainly not an expert in urban transformations or in regional resilience, I, I tend to believe that uh, some of the things that we see actually from the water patterns have to do with development, uh, have to do with resilience, and have to do with inequality, something I care very much uh, for like your teachers. So uh, the, the, the main, I can anticipate the main lines of uh, 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 lines of thought that uh, my talk will follow is that um, uh, while the impact of improved agriculture, uh, it's or uh, uh, of uh, urban transformations, for instance, it perceived immediately and directly by uh, economic dry economic indicators like gross domestic products and the likes. Of, a, of a whatever region, whatever appropriate scale you might devise, economists who have worked from that for a long time, um, the, uh, uh, the social and economic costs incurred with the, uh, with the ecosystem services you lose, in many a case, not all, but in many cases, is typically uh, largely unnoticed. It doesn't enter the balance sheet. So the very idea that I want to, uh, to uh, 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 I'll make specific examples, of course, in the course of things. It's, and while contemporary economics, in fact, considers the proper manner to account for the, uh, for the cost of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, loss of workforce of any kind, certainly we can 
actually devised fairly well. We are pre development economics, so it is called. It's fairly fairly developed discipline, and it rules, in fact, uh, whether covertly or or overtly our our lives. Then um, uh, uh, immaterial factors pitch in, and um, a true assessment of the values, the uh, natural capital you lose by certain things, but certainly includes urban transformations, and certainly have to do with regional resilience. And uh, so I'll be I'll be somewhat insisting on on some of these concepts in what uh, comes about. And the picture you see here, I know it just uh, uh, you see that. Well, I put uh, on the upper right corner that uh, that. Uh, uh, the remainder of the screen of a Zoom thing in there, which seen here is Sir Partha Dasgupta from Cambridge University, good friend of mine, and um, major uh, mover and shaker in environmental economics, in fact, one of the founders of the discipline. And um, if you look, uh, if you Google him up, uh, you see that they, he's re very recently has been frontline news because of a so-called Dasgupta report on the economics of biodiversity. It's a, it's a very long and elaborate book, but it's, I, I only read because I'm waiting um, in good quality time, like in Easter vacation, for instance, to read it thoroughly. But I, I, I read the executive summary and it's absolutely breathtaking, super, uh, um, super uh, interesting and profound. Well, what is his thesis? As, as you see here, he reported something from his beautiful uh, the, the Development of Nature and the Nature of Development uh, was the title of a, the long article for Political Weekly, Political Science Weekly, that uh, he published a few years back, not very many, in fact. What he contains is that uh, an economy gross domestic product, or whatever measure you want to have of a well being, of a wealth of nations, if it could be made to grow, and its related societal indicators made by, um, uh, can be made to improve for, for a while by mining natural capital. What is natural capital? Is the, is the ensemble of ecosystem services that nature provides for free, in fact, and we tend to devalue precisely for that reason. That is, um, uh, the loss of uh, natural capital because you're decimating forests, damaging soils, destroying ecosystem services like, um, in particular case I'll be showing you, has to do with water. And this is taken from a picture I took in Burkina Faso where I did some field work for studying waterborne disease and the lady is simply crossing the spillway, operating spillway of an ephemeral stream in a sub-Saharan, uh, 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 nearly tropical, nearly equatorial in fact, climate which you're hanging there. And um, I'll talk about the development in this case embodied by, the, uh, by a small dam and the ensuing uh, irrigation structure, and um, and uh, uh, those ecosystem services could be, uh, as I was um, hinting at, uh, renewable resources or reducing biodiversity, whose price you can certainly not uh, immediately use. But the Pathos thesis is that there is no excuse for not using what we have learned recently to assess the true costs and benefits that include the loss of natural capital, and I make a specific example of what follows and to rethink something very, uh, very clearly worded in the presentation of your beautiful urban transformations class and series of lecture. That is how to rethink distributed justice where a large share of the basis of our environmental thinking could be made quantitative. One of the main liabilities in fact is that precisely hinging on the fact that it's, it's uh, in many a case is too vague, too lightweight, the kind of predictions that uh, economists are allowed to make in terms of, uh, in, of uh, 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 for instance, the ecosystem services. It's one of the liabilities of ecology. That's why engineers and boilermakers uh, can help because we are inherently uh, 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 quantitative. Oops. Why can't I progress? Okay, here it is. And let me make um, an example, which is um, a trivial example from a beautiful paper, which I recommend for all of you to read, because it's written by a famous mathematician in, a, a, in contemporary physics in 2005. It's a very obscure journal, and it has lovely like 5,000 citations because the piece is written beautifully well and explains the mathematics of complexity in a straightforward manner. 
what you see here, it's a, one of those uh, uh, calculations you can do by opening any uh, archive in any particular place of the world. That is, you have essentially a, an archive of a size uh, of a cities ranked by population in any particular case. In the case in the United States, in a particular year. And what you have in there, you simply do, uh, you, uh, you calculate and it's trivial. Uh, you set, for instance, population and tenth of course, you have to define what is a city. And what is a city, of course, it's your urban transformation. Let's suppose that the city is something which is bigger than, say, 100 people gathered together, right? The smallest city, in fact, they're making fun of what is the smallest city, um, population four uh, or something. But let's assume that, um, let's avoid, for the sake of argument, the definition of what is a city, suppose it's a reasonably large human gathering with some admin structure behind it, okay? So what you do essentially here, you count uh, uh, the, uh, you have a population of each size and you set a threshold, for instance, 10,000 people, then 100,000, then a million, then 10 millions, and you count the relative proportion of the cities you have in your whatever geographic area you're studying, um, relative proportion, that is the number of cities uh, uh, larger than or smaller than, it's a complement of that, a certain value divided by the total number of cities you have in your archive. And you get a curve like the one um, you see on the left, okay? So you have like in this case, 20, uh, 200,000 or 400,000, it's a particular sample of the United States. And what uh, the uh, Newman asks you is to have something which can do with any of those tools, you can do it even on your phone if you want, that is put it in the log log plot. And I'm afraid I don't have to tell a boilermaker what the log log plot is, right? And something like what you're seeing here appears. It is something in which what plots is a straight line in the log log plot. Obviously, if you take a logarithm of a P of X, of course, in this case, it's probability, the probability density function, if you want, or I'll show you in a minute, the probability of exceedance is what I showed here. So it's no trick. The two things are completely related. But it's supposed to be the underlying random variable that you want to define, that is the size of a city uh, well, at a certain point in time. Why? It's interesting because you want to monitor urban transformations, right? So the X is the size of a city and the probability density of X is simply something of this kind, right? And uh, if that is the shape uh, I want to test, what I do in a plot in the log log plot, you're gonna have the log P is equal to uh, log of C minus alpha times the log of X by mathematical properties you know from high school. Certainly from boilermakers have been exposed to that uh, for a fair amount of times. Now, uh, I have been uh, uh, attending very serious theoretical physics conferences, especially in the, in the early, uh, in, in the, at the beginning of the century when this was a very hot debate. Um, and you've been people discussing what is a straight line in log log plot, what fits as a straight line in log log plot, which is not immediate. But I mean, it doesn't take um, a very sophisticated uh, statistical analyst to see that this very much looks like a power law that is a structure of this kind. And the slope of this curve is exactly this value alpha, which is Quite interesting, in fact, because for instance, this alpha has to be larger than one. And um, uh, in, for this distribution to be normalizable, you have to have a mixed mean, but that's interesting because we said you cannot have a city of size zero. It's not a city, right? So you have a minimum value for sure. And alpha has to be um, a larger than one, the empirical value you observe better larger than two because there are consequences, but I'm not talking about the mathematics of uh, power laws uh, anymore. And so it's essentially, I'm asking you to count relative proportions you can do in an Excel sheet and plot them in a log log plot, any kind. Take the, uh, uh, the size of the cities in Indiana, it does already something of that kind. When you take the Midwest, when you take the US, you have those data electronically, you see that this is remarkable. And in fact, the slope of this curve is remarkably close. This alpha is close, larger than or near two, which is what is called zip law. That is something which in the, in the East history of quantitative urbanism plays a role because of the size of a city was what it was devised for. And then why power laws matter? Well, uh, uh, the idea is that um, uh, power laws, I won't do the math, but is essentially 
um, is a distribution scale invariant. But is, is a distribution that whatever scale you look at, or however you decide to coarse grain, for instance, if you want to average, uh, if you take the value of what you observe within Indiana, uh, the distribution you have within Indiana, or in the Midwest, or in the US, uh, should be the same. If that is a true uh, 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 probability distribution that follows this algebraic law in here. And uh, why this is important? Because scale invariance is a signature of something which is fundamental in this, the theory of dynamic systems, because it's, it's, it's the signature of something which um, uh, uh, is essentially inevitable. What it means in essentially inevitable? So you can do anything about it. I mean, you perturb the system as you damn please, and the system will go back to initial state. And this is particularly interesting. I, uh, the conferences I was mentioning in which uh, people have been discussing uh, for a very long time, what is a straight line in a log-log plot? What fits a straight line in a log-log plot? It was when Per Bach, my friend, the inventor of the SOC, Sergon Aritmicality Theory, was roaming uh, conferences all over the world explaining this thing. The idea of statistical inevitability is something which is very important because um, if the outcomes of an open dissipative system uh, with a huge number of degrees of freedom is the same regardless of initial conditions, regardless of tuning of parameters, with adding a, 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 god, a, a goddess that uh, tunes the parameter, the thousands, of, tens of thousands or millions of parameters that uh, define the urban transformation. That means there is something which is quite interesting. Rather than completely chaotic, the system goes at the exact opposite system. Power laws are telling you that. And um, well, what's interesting because um, in fact, that clarifies briefly and it's a technicality, but the fact that if you want to study the probability distribution that is a sample, you have to do a thing which is called the binning. That is to calculate uh, how many you have in a certain area, um, you have to essentially state a bin and say how many guys fall within that area and you divide by the size of the integral. So what looks smooth in a uh, log in a linear plot looks rough in a log linear plot when you have oscillations that um, uh, tell you, okay, look, there's something quite interesting about fluctuations in the system because uh, when you have, for instance, how many cities you have of size like uh, uh, whatever, uh, but this is a particular sample taken from a, it's a synthetic sample, it's not a city, but how many cities you have around 10 million, have only one. So you have an issue of paucity of data, uh, in, which is generated and exacerbated by uh, the size of your sample. So the idea is that you can always do that and change the sample into something like a logarithmic binning, or better than anything, you simply take the percentages. If you take the size of a system with value larger than X, uh, um, plots beautifully well, like a straight line in this case. And what happens is that the slope of this guy is related to this one by uh, one, uh, for instance, the, the PDF, the P of X has an exponent alpha, the other hand an exponent alpha minus one. And an example I want to show you, it's, it's uh, something I, I worked on for many a time, is where uh, I, it's a particular narrow and idiosyncratic uh, 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 the uh, uh, view, of course, it reflects the five cents I know, what I'm saying is that my, I never claim that my reflections are not idiosyncratic. They are certainly, and they are my, these are my path to my idiosyncratic reflections on resilience, inequalities, and development. And it's the very the network. Something you can extract objectively, manipulate over orders of magnitude simply based on digital terrain maps, which you can buy by green grocers nowadays and free on a scale of 30 by 30 meters worldwide. And you can extract beautiful shapes that are generated by the system. So essentially, in there, the master variable is essentially at any point through the drainage directions, which is gravity rule, uh, which is fairly easy to extract. And if you take for any size within the, 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 your catchment, you can calculate the total contributing area, which is the number of nodes you have connected on your back. And this is a random variable, and which has a certain, a certain features. Don't look at the, at the recycled slides in which I was talking about more serious mathematics that is involved with it and um, see what happens. That's also an interesting feature, which is part of the scaling and that fails many observers, even um, important ones. And that has, has to do with what I'm trying to tell you today. But is, suppose this is the largest size of a very large catchment, okay? And this is a probability of exceedance of area. Because you close your eyes, 
you point your finger at the map, and this is a, the value calculated there. You have a total contributing area because you have a tree in there, and the number of nodes connected, it's a quantity which is inescapable and it's unique. You treat this as a random variable and you study the probability of exceedance of a certain value, small a, as you see in here. Now, what happens is that you do have this effect, but it's, it's, a, it's a power law with a well-known coefficient. We can explain how nature works in a sense, but it dies off as soon as you approach the largest size of area. Now, why this is interesting? Because if you chose, if you chose a smaller sample, okay, you will still have, but much of it has enough data, so it falls on the power law, but falls off relatively soon because you can't have areas or statistics of them there off larger than the maximum one you allow yourself to, to, to explore. So there is a sample effect. There is the finiteness of a sample effect, and this is called the finite size effect, which, as I've been trying to show, will have a small role, and it has a major role in science because the guy who developed it uh, through the renormalization group approach got the Nobel Prize in, Will in, in physics, Dr. Wilson, in fact. And, um, but it's very important even for uh, modest engineering purposes. So we learned that's where we come from. We learned how to extract from digital terrain maps. Well, this, look, this is a, a leader or lidar, as you prefer, um, a, a flight in which you get uh, elevations, very precise, filtered vegetation uh, over the size of a stamp nowadays. And you can actually extract those landforms and wonder, for instance, uh, I'm tempted to see that there is an interplay of, of the built and the natural environment in this case, although it's not totally obvious to me, but certain beauty pitches in. And the idea that the only way you can actually start thinking of uh, attributing values, for instance, cultural services to the ecosystem, ecosystem services that can be cultural services, the beauty, for instance, pleasure and the likes, uh, uh, seems to be uh, within reach. Well, power laws are, are, are almost everywhere. There are many of them, and uh, many processes tend to show this particular behavior. And these are called Pareto distributions, because in some, some cases, you have a tail, which is an algebraic tail, but is plot straight in a log log plot. And it can be big and can be very large. But these cutoff effects, in fact, can be reasonably uh, well considered within a framework that could be a cutoff in which you have a minimum size cutoff over maximum size cutoff. For instance, one example I adore, and this, the other one, population of the city is the one we have seen, uh, that uh, is called the zip law. And uh, richness is something talking about inequality, net worth in US dollars, the distribution of richness in a sense, which tends to be a power law, a mark of inequality, because I have very few guys that are super rich, and a hell of a lot of guys, the largest proportion that, in fact, have not. So the difference between have nots and haves, as you in jargon you typically say, is one in which um, that tends to be broadened, in fact. But this is super interesting, and I would take, in fact, a two hour lecture on this. Um, but is, if you take uh, the Koran, or you take uh, uh, the Bible, or if you take uh, uh, Moby Dick, which was done for the first time, and you study the frequency of words, what is absolutely phenomenal is that uh, the slope of a frequency, of a use of words in different languages, different ages, different aims, etc., is exactly the same, regardless of the type of book you're reading. So what this is telling us is that Chomsky is right, that he is uh, probably grammar and language is a reflection of the way we're built in, in our brain. But anyways, that's not what I wanted to tell you, but it's relevant to another issue more directly. I could chat about that for a good two hours anyways. So um, this is taken from a work in which I had a part because I suggested the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scaling analysis that were carried out. Uh, the guy is an urban scientist, an urbanist. Uh, there was a Lausanne at the time. He got his PhD and then moved on uh, somewhere with the fact that with a company in Switzerland, uh, Emanuele Strano. And what he took on was the study of, um, uh, of uh, the global road network, which is a very large database. It required a very, it's big data, big, big, big data, actually. 
And what the guy was capable of doing by proper layering of something which is uh, probably, you know, a hundred times better than I do, it's, um, it's uh, the idea on how, in fact, you would be attributing area to urban areas, cropland areas, or semi so called natural areas, the colors you see in there, red, blue, or whatever. And, um, and you define uh, what, what are links that are parts, what is the length of the road? You take junctions, and junctions should be defined properly, of course. I'm not giving you a detail, but that's uh, absolutely ordinary. And you define uh, link length, that is the road length, is the size in between two consecutive junctions, nodes of the system. Now you count them, okay, something of this kind. So they get a fraction of total road length, for instance. And um, you see that, of course, you can't have roads bigger than, say, something like uh, 100 kilometers, right? This is 10 kilometers, and this is a 1,000 kilometers or something. But certainly what you can say is that the footprint of, uh, 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 of uh, ongoing urbanization is immediately shown in something you can remotely acquire and exactly manipulate, like in this case, the road length structure, which is, this is data, there's no manipulation whatsoever. Not only that, what you can say that in reality by manipulating, by using those scaling arguments, you see, uh, that is, uh, you, you look at the structure and you can do some tricks, for instance, studying what happens to the probability distribution, you see, very different, much shorter, the one uh, in which you have urban areas, in fact, and it's typically the case, right? The urbanization has a footprint, has a clear footprint in the shortened length of the, of the links because you have to serve way more nodes essentially. And yet there's something, as you see in here, in which you can have those distributions collapse. So you're perhaps telling you, look, footprints are evident, and yet uh, there's something of the features that call for inevitability that pitch in at a certain point. And it can do that in particular, if you, stood, if you study, for instance, the rural uh, roads of India, it's a hotbed for urban transformations, of course, because it's uh, of a, the, the, the pace that you had in there. Well, what's called developing world is something quite interesting. If you think of my friend, Jonathan Ledgard, master of contemporary thought, visiting professor at EPFL for a couple of years and chief, uh, um, uh, econ the chief correspondent of The Economist from Africa, um, said in a famously delivered beautiful talk that for instance, you know what's the pace of transformation? Think that within the next 15 years, he said last year, 800 uh, million Africans will live in cities that do not exist yet in 15 years, one five. So the idea is that is there any way of calculating footprints, for instance, uh, and, and uh, those properties, you can use some of those beautiful properties of power laws. If power laws will tend to become, then if you coarse grain the distribution, the distribution should be untouched because the distribution looks like whatever the scale you look at. And that's something which you can test uh, physically. So in a sense, you can actually through GIS tools so or geographic information systems and a bit of a, an idea what we believe that should be in fact the footprint of the urban transformation should do the trick for us. And that's also an interesting plot. Suppose that now the richness, as we have seen empirically, obeys a power law distribution. So few rich guys and many poor guys. And inequalities tend to be exacerbated, in fact, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the pandemics ongoing, of course, because the protected uh, social classes are not very many indeed. I mean, I belong to one which is protected, in fact, so I, that's not why I should be particularly happy. But what happens is that, so the distribution of, of the, the quantity, and that's empirically known, I showed you, to you before. But what happens is that you can calculate the fraction of a population, for instance, and that's the trick that does it for you. You want to know what is the fraction of population which supports half of a of a wealth and half of a, a and, and the fraction of the population. This is the way well, you calculated this value one half. And if you do you carry out the calculation, you find the, the ratio of this, this you see is actually from one half to, uh, to the total is the fraction of a relative wealth. You call W this value here, and you call P the fraction of the population. That is one which you don't put the P here. So that's a fraction of the population in there. And uh, the exact result is that 
the value is p of alpha minus two divided by alpha minus one, p raised to. It's an exact result, pretty easy to derive. What happens is that now figure that uh, uh, the distribution of wealth has a typically is a power law of distribution that very closely approximates 2.1. That is larger than two, just larger than two. Why this is particularly worrisome? Because that means that the two, the, 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 uh, the, 20% of the richest population owns 80%, more than 80% of the wealth. So the, the inequality is majestic, meaning the upper, the richest 20% of the population embedded in a distribution which has the feature of statistical inevitability. It will happen almost no matter what you do that uh, will concentrate inequalities in a, in a spasmodic manner. Which introduces me to another thing, which uh, this is again back to my friend Partha Daskupta. And it is then, um, isn't that perhaps because we don't calculate wealth properly? Well, no economy can be uh, made to prosper forever by mining natural capital. The example that I show you here is the transformation of a, of a mangrove swamp into something which should be drained and uh, uh, converters say, that's example I typically take because that's the case here, um, into a, 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 like a, a cement surface over which you build a commercial center. And uh, the account of depreciation for natural capital means that in the GDP of that area, it was immediately see, I mean, immediately in a year or two, the benefits of employment, uh, of uh, commerce or whatever you name it, okay? But certainly you do see the costs of ecosystem services you have lost. They were issued by nature freely in terms of fiber production, this and fish nursery area, flood protections, you name it, carbon sequestration and the likes, even on a grand scale. And uh, why am I suggesting that and why this touches the issue of uh, reducing inequalities, which is central in your, in your considerations? Because it's called the curse of a Kuznets curves. What are they? Okay, Kuznets was an expat, Nobel Prize for Economics, was a Harvard professor, in which he uh, plotted these variously quoted, in fact, curves, in which essentially, if you have a per capita income or proxied by proxy for economic development, and here you have certain outgrowths like pollution on one side on social equality, what Kutznes used to say is that in pre-industrial societies in transition, you had these um, inequalities increasing, only to have it beyond a certain establishment point, the richer the society, the lower the level of social inequality. And the same happens for pollution. At a certain point, a developed society, I mean, first uh, there was a famous Latin say that at first you have to survive and then you can start uh, being philosophizing about uh, matters of this kind. So we were under the spell of a Kutznets curve in which we said, well, let's start from bother. Um, let's get richer. And then things will mend themselves automatically. Well, enter Thomas Piketty uh, in this beautiful book. Uh, uh, well, beautiful is a strange word for a book, which is like 800 pages. Uh, the first 30 are totally exciting. And then it's boring like hell because it's an empirical book, etc. who nevertheless had enjoyed planetary success. It's called Capital in the 21st Century. And it took head on the Kuznets curve and demonstrated that the reason why uh, uh, Kuznets had that empirical, he reproduced the empirical evidence that Kuznets based his considerations on, but they were post Second World War uh, uh, recovery, thereby not representing what happens now. It is far from true that richer means uh, today means a more equal, a richer society is, is uh, sports and supports and fosters less inequality, even empirically and on a factual basis. That's something we have to remember. So the idea is that uh, we have to be fair. We have to price the planet. We have to put the price tag on what uh, we see in the system. We have to, uh, it's kind of considered you now unclassy in certain circles. I mean, you have, there's something fishy about uh, leaving the price tag on a thing. It's not stylish, right? But in reality, to say that something is priceless means it's worth nothing in economic terms. And uh, the key why we've been uh, slow in realizing that, you see, for instance, is how can you, can you put a price tag on, on beauty? This is my, the Laguna Venice, my hometown. And um, 
my my birthplace. Actually, I'm, I live. I've been living outside the city for many for many months now. Which you have this symbol, the signs of a coexistence of uh, 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 anthropic activities of a built environment. In this case, fishermen's nets and the signs of the self-organized uh, uh, system of. In this case, it's, it's a tidal network. Not the next one, but this cost the concept of tides. Uh, fairly well, nonetheless. And this is an example that uh, my friend uh, Suresh and Satish, uh, uh, my friends are bored to see, but um, something I care for. I took a picture in Bangladesh where I was doing field work on, on cholera, uh, on the, say, the ecology of the, of the water controlled, of the cholera pathogen. And uh, what happens is that this guy was actually trying to show me that it can't be uh, the water, the mighty waters of the Magna River that um, causes infections. Well, by the way, I, I keep I keep going. I, I assume that my that my I still have six minutes and sixteen seconds before the fortieth minute. So uh, this guy was showing that it can't be the water. The Magna is a, is a mighty river, etc. The only thing is that this guy was drinking the water like two hundred meters downstream of the largest diarrheal disease uh, hospital in the world in da in, in Matlab believe it or not, uh, near to Dhaka, Bangladesh, where, in fact, uh, the pathogen uh, evolved originally in the system. Now, why I was disturbed by that, and it's a cover of my uh, recent book, I'll show you at uh, the end of a, of a discussion to see my, 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 my punchline, is that, can we predict whether the guy will catch cholera or not? Very complicated. Why? Because you catch cholera if you, uh, if you drink uh, a dose of bacteria, if you ingest a dose of bacteria, that depends on your body weight, essentially, but depends on the number. And the probability of being capable of predicting the pointwise concentration of, a, uh, of pathogens here, given that you don't even know the boundary condition upstream, you don't know uncertainties and things run so huge, but in reality, you see that our, the weakness of our predictions is a permanent liability in our capability to put price tags, serious price tags. An example particularly important, sorry for the, I forgot the label in Italian here, is a debilitating disease called schistosomiasis, something which is generated by a cycle in which a pathogen survives in the bowel in the urinary tract of a person, then be excreted with feces or depending on the type of bug, if you want. It's excreted in a certain form, uh, which is called uh, the schistosoma japonicum or mansoni or hematobio, depending on what it happens, et cetera. It has to infect an intermediate host uh, which is a, 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 a freshwater snail of a bulinus genus, etc., that um, hatches uh, this particular pathogen called cercaria. And if you put your hands um, in the water, you catch the disease. It can be clear by getting uh, the uh, anti-parasite uh, praziquantel, but it doesn't give you any immunity. So you can get it as many times as you go next to the water. And you see that uh, this is a uh, learning impairing uh, and disability, a strong disability thing. And what happens is this is happening in Burkina Faso where the incidence of that, um, uh, of that uh, disease became gigantic. This is a picture I took right after the big first big storm. These, um, uh, the water courses are ephemeral. And where they built something like 1500 small dams financed by the um, World Bank by generating huge um, uh, uh, networks of uh, uh, irrigation structures. With the result that um, the incidence of a disease went sky high. So what, what was disturbing is that the meta-analysis of uh, the relation between schistosomiasis and water resources development um, shows that there is, can be any possible doubt. The, a, the fostering a better agriculture through, uh, through the extension of uh, agricultural networks, in fact, uh, very large and very developed, 1,500 dams, I mean, no kidding thing is certainly showing up in the GDP of Burkina Faso, but certainly the cost of the incidence of a disabled uh, years of workforce, of a poverty reinforcing effects of a disease, it's, it's, it's not seen by it. And with that ecosystem services and the natural capital that goes after that. So I'm just uh, running around. What I'm saying is that with these considerations, I'm showing you three giants of the field, Ignacio Rodriguez from Texas A&M University, Ilka Hansky, the late Ilka Hansky, the ecologist, and Marino Gatto, my colleague and friend, the theoretical ecologist, started building on that and um, started thinking whether we could, how far we could stretch this concept by using, in particular, Steve Hubble's 
a gigantic step forward with the unified neutral theory of biodiversity and biogeography, which I won't be able to discuss today. Uh, long story short, to make uh, the idea that you can actually calculate, and that's the urban transformations that uh, you can take into account. For instance, by changing, for instance, uh, by removing some of the small dams artificially in silico, if you care, um, you can calculate the mean distance from any human settlement to the water and with it the probability that um, of the incident of the disease. In effect, the, the random removal of small dams gets an increase in this measure. This measure is the prevalence of a disease from zero to one. The pockets in which you have prevalence one in a certain age group um, diminish sensibly. And this is a basis through which you can calculate what happens in that. So as you go, because I'm pretty sure that this will um, soon bloom out of proportion. Um, the idea is that then um, you can study disease and waterborne disease in particular in this case. So um, what I'm showing you is just uh, other field work. I, I delighted in doing field work in this case in Haiti at the peak of the 2010 uh, uh, outbreak, which is the you know it, it's a, it's a symbol of our responsibilities because. Um, uh, Haiti, the poorest country in the world, struck by an earthquake that killed 300,000 in 2010, um, was in fact seeded. It was cholera free for like 200 years. And uh, the disease was seeded by UN peacekeeping troops coming from Nepal, which is a shame. And uh, it's not a story I'll tell you about. Uh, and uh, uh, only to introduce the last thing, and you have a super expert of the subject and professors. Fukusuri, Satish is a real expert. Right? What happens is this lady that was approaching this guy here and uh, in the, at the height of the cholera epidemics um, in the Carrefour uh, uh, suburb of Port-au-Prince, again, the most dilapidated market in the poorest country in the world. What happens is that this lady has shown a Nokia 1900, the phone, for a proof of concept and got one of those cabbages to take away. That shocked me because it means that you wonder about the society in which sewers or uh, a, 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 a piped uh, water, here it is, I'm only five minutes short. Yep, and I'll be concluding fairly rapidly within five minutes. And uh, so you had no police in this case, no roads because no road infrastructure remained after the earthquake. And still Nokia had inroads in that. And the ownership of the phone, for instance, as um, no social layering or social connotation, we thought. So long story short, you can show where people move by tracking their phones. And this, um, how in fact you can model cumulative cases from data and model. And of course, I won't uh, bore you with that. But what I'm saying is that in particular, this is important to say, well, you could actually have, you heard perhaps about gravity model, radiation models and the likes. Well, try to go to Senegal, like with Flavio Finger, my student did, what you see here is the number of uh, people tracked by uh, the phone calls, old phones. In fact, you needed to make a call to be able to end to be relatively roughly related. New generation of phones, in fact, have a GPS um, uh, embedded. So you have, in fact, on, can have very large numbers if commercial reasons don't prevent it to know where people go. And what you see here in the actual movement of a population, you have peaks. What are the peaks? These are religious pilgrimages. This is a Gran Bagal de Tuba one year and the next year. And these are all the things of uh, religious ceremonies. What is interesting, so this is the population during the Gran Bagal de Tuba, concentrating in the place where they sing. It's, it's one of those uh, uh, very respectable events, et cetera. But uh, for us, if you have a concentration like 100 times more than the normal population, which you're seeing here, you expect that you can have sanitary problems, et cetera. And this is the map of where the disease was spread throughout the system. Also because in fact, uh, human mobility, this is how it operates in Senegal, in fact, and this is how it simulates the system. A uh, long story short for showing you that that's instead something completely different, but relevant because if there is one thing that's changing our lives and uh, the future of cities in terms of as advertising your beautiful uh, leaflet for your class is COVID-19. This is, I'm sorry for them, I forgot to change the label. It's still in Italian. This is how, in fact, the epidemics spread in Italy uh, in the early phases of the thing. And there's nothing like a mixed system in there. So look what happens in my region, the Veneto region, close to the place where Suresh got his beautiful uh, 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 shirt. 
uh, that is porting up. These are the new events. And what you see in here, you see spotty things, etc. These are the daily new cases in a place and the cumulative patterns, etc. This is how, in fact, you can have uh, these things simulated. And you can generate systems in which, in fact, even in this case, by the same token, by tracking mobility of the people, by tracking phones, in fact, in vital, vital, vital ingredients of a spread of infections, you can actually make computed and, uh, and simulated values of a system. That's my last slide. And that uh, what I'm saying is that um, uh, we, we, I mean, we published a book, uh, in fact, in November 2020, which um, contains not the urban part of it, but the reflected in water part. That's what I'm saying. So uh, I'm asking, uh, will future large scale water resources uh, plan uh, be capable of making compelling arguments for including the reduction of the loss of biodiversity in the across the river basin? Or uh, could the structure of the river network be a template for the spreading of waterborne disease? Can it be seen as a template for urban transformations, as, as we have seen in some cases uh, indeed? Or for instance, for the matter, would it be suggesting the main directions of a population migration, something which is very important in coupling the system. And I'm coming to my uh, conclusions. I'm, I'm leaving to you to respect the five minutes of the other uh, blah, blah. But what I'm saying is that uh, what is what I care very much for, it's why this is a very important for the issues of your, of your class. Uh, a fair distribution of water is a major societal and economic goal. Uh, something which would involve discounting the environment and completely rethinking social equality. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, we'll take some oh, questions. reasonably close to what you wanted, <laughs> Suresh. Thank you, thank you very much. We will take some questions from the audience, if there are any. Unmute yourself, please, and ask a question and then mute yourself so Andrea has a chance to respond. Are they able to unmute themselves, Gaia? They should yeah. be, yes. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> How are you, son? Uh, I think, uh, Ciao, Dr. Dr. Leonardo, yeah. Uh, good to see you. Lovely. Yeah, good to see you. I'm in the same continent. Um, so first of all, thank you so much. Well, you um, are in Leipzig, right? In Magdeburg. <laughs> Whatever. Close yeah, enough. not so. Yeah, not. Yeah, close <laughs> yeah. enough. <laughs> um, I actually, my question is not. I think it's not a question. I want to. I I'm curious to listen your perspective to expand my thought as well. Um, so, as we know a lot of like scale invariance in a diverse systems in urban or natural landscapes and um, how we can, uh, and also from let's say ecosystem or ecological world, there are more diversity are acknowledged as more worthy. So I see like there are two terms, like there is a similarity which manifested as the, like a scaling in the mean. Uh, and the other point is like scaling in variability. So how we can like harmonize these two opposite terms to make, let's say more ecosystem better and more sustainable and like more resilience like yeah, as a researcher, so what kind of perspective or some like philosophy needs to be embedded? <laughs> yeah. That's a very good question, actually. And, and uh, well, I, I give you my five cents. I'm not uh, pretending that I'm uh, particularly enlightened in this. But what I'm saying is that, look, um, um, when in science we go hierarchical, right? So we take uh, the simplest possible model and see whether what is telling you. And uh, from there, you move on to make it. Uh, things which are progressively more realistic with respect to what uh, happens in the system. That's a case, for instance, of pure power laws, which have been the frontier. Then Pareto, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, started the Italian economist working in Lausanne, by the way, um, started saying, okay, now it can't be, and you have to have uh, some sort of a the, the, the distribution, the Pareto distribution has a tail, which is a power law. 
but and then you have something else, uh, a finite size effect, if you want, to other things in which uh, they can progressively uh, tell you how you could see whether there are those signs. And those pieces of the power laws, mind you, they have to be on a reasonable uh, range size to be meaningful because everything looks straight for a little bit on a long, long plot, no? So you have, but there are tools to, say, to, to, to establish whether you can actually make the statistical claim that the sample belongs to the distribution. But there are certain symptoms which are the, what beautifully Benoit Mendel brought, whom I remember and honor no matter what, uh, uh, called the syndrome of infinite variance. For instance, the scale of variability you'll be talking about. Suppose, so you take a sample, okay? And or for instance, take uh, uh, daily rainfall, okay? Measured in Padua, they started in 1690 and they've been operating ever since, one of the longest time, uh, time series, okay? So what you do is said, okay, let's take uh, the weekly variability that you have in daily variation. So you're talking at scaling of the fluctuations, okay? I'm not making very particular sophisticated math. Think of that, okay? So you have one week and you can calculate the standard deviation in that week, okay? But then how many weeks you have in like 300 years? A hell of a lot, 300 times 52, uh, which is the weeks of the thing, et cetera. So it's a large sample. So you take the average of that. That's the mean fluctuations you have for a signal when it lasts for, uh, for a week. Now take a month, okay? And so you calculate the variability over the month, right? And then, uh, and then you take the average over the 300 times 12 months you have in the time series. I'm making 300 years to make it simple, but it's more or less 300 years, okay? Next, and I'm getting to what you know, it's called the Hurst effect. You look how, whether there is a, an effect. You simply plot the average of a fluctuation against the duration, that is uh, seven days, 30 days, a year, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, 300 years, in which you have only one value. One value, but it's a huge number of points, right? Now, Mandelbrot beautifully said, and it's a property of a power law, that's absolutely trivial calculation that the high school student can do. Now, if you have that this grows without bounds, that's what Mandelbrot called the syndrome of infinite variance. That is, you, by manipulating an elementary manner, the beauty of those signatures of inevitability, it's easy to calculate, period. If there is an effect that is with the size grows the range you explore, then the system is telling you something. I'm trying to get to a state in which regardless of the initial condition of my dynamic process, regarding of the parameters you have, regarding of whatever you want to have, you're gonna have the same result. If a self, the critical self-organization which is the essence of why the what we look around rather than having a system in which nothing is fixed, etc. You would expect that with the number of degrees of freedom you have in phenomena like, for instance, the distribution of a statistical feature of a, of a river network or distribution of wealth, or a stupid example. Why on earth the grammar, the book textbook of grammar in your original language and, and Melville's Moby Dick should have the same distribution of a frequency of words? Isn't that because it's inevitable? And this is easy to measure. The beauty of power laws and those scaling analysis uh, in pinpointing uh, the, uh, the features that make a phenomenon inevitable as opposed to controllable in some manner are also the ones that allow us, if you look at, for instance, as that uh, scaling analysis was technologically very evolved, scientifically was very easy, but technologically very evolved because if you take the global road network, the technical capabilities to manage those files is gigantic. So it's big, big data, right? And you see the city, where's the city? You see that was the actual roads. So you have indicators of urban, of going to urban transformations and possibly where you headed for and possibly whether the society you'll be facing will be a, one in which you have not had less inequalities. I'm afraid not, but uh, that's, uh, at least you know it, right? So you can countermeasure those values. I don't believe neither in, in communism nor in capitalism, as was famously said in a beautiful book about patterns in nature, 
So uh, those kind of network structure are kind of an in-between, neither nor. Sorry, I took, <laughs> I stretched the point, but what I'm saying, yes. But what I'm saying, I always, so Jan, I always would like to take, take the simple statistics, you make it, the hierarchy is that simple and you complicate it neither. But in many a case, those even a log log plot of a probability of exceedance by relative frequency of an observed thing does wonders in telling you what's happening. I see. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, like a multi criteria, uh, like a multi combination of uh, different kind of the power law plots, like whether fluctuation scaling or some scaling from the mean. Yeah. But for instance, a study the scaling of fluctuations with the size of sample. Mm -hmm. Because you can have, and I, and I recommend, uh, if you take a look at the beauty, the, the, the Newman uh, paper, uh, you, if you just Newman Contemporary Physics 2005 or whatever, it's like a 40 page thing, etc. It starts from elementary concepts and it's done beautifully well. I recommend it even to undergraduate students because it takes elementary mathematics to get you very deep concepts, etc. In there, it's explained wonderfully well because in a finite sample, in a system, for instance, a power law with, a, say, uh, a coefficient in between two and three, uh, the mean diverges, right? So what happens is that, and why is that any finite sample has a finite mean? Mm -hmm. But the syndrome is that if you take larger and larger samples, you'll see how this diverges, and that's an estimate. Yeah, that's that's an estimate. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Stefano Basso. Hey, Stefano. Hey, that's family. Again. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi, good to see you. I go to see you. I Thanks for the talk. I wanted to ask you something about connected also to what you mentioned now, this uh, inevitabil ine inevitability. So my question is, uh, this the system that has these scaling properties has some, from my point of view, drawbacks. For example, you mentioned that they show uh, infinite variance, and this is a problem because, uh, for example, it's difficult to, uh, I don't know, estimate what is the behavior. I'm thinking about, for example, the results for river networks in terms of floods. So once we know that uh, also the, like, uh, the anthropogenic system, like cities, they tend to have this, this same, to, we tend to build the same pattern. Can we build in a way that we don't build this pattern to avoid the drawbacks of, of these structures? I mean, do you think something like that would be possible? I have to, Stephen, I have two things to note. Um, the first is that, um, uh, of course, uh, infinite variance or infinite mean apply in the infinite sample size. It's a property of the population of a disability distribution. Any finite sample, which is anything you could see from data, has a finite mean, period. The idea then is taking subsamples of different sizes and whether they, as, as you make your subsample bigger, whether they diverge. That's the syndrome. That, this is telling you the system is tending to go to there. But from the theory of dynamic system, what is interesting is the following. Um, what is chaos? It's a system in which a minute perturbation of initial conditions can lead to completely different outcomes, right? The butterflies uh, uh, batting their uh, their wings uh, in uh, in Delhi, generating a hurricane in New York City or something, or whatever. Lorenz uh, transformation. So the infinite, infinite sensitivity to conditions that through the you know, kind of nonlinearity. Okay, that's that's an interesting concept. So why then? Um, Every single river networks in the world in the runoff generating area, regardless of uh, vegetation, climate, exposed lithology, you name it, whatever, uh, has the same statistical features. It's a the other spectrum of, uh, I'm talking about river networks, but it happens in a, in a number of, why the distribution, I mean, the example I find most compelling is why the uh, Frequency distribution of words, words defined even in, in, in electronic text is easy, whatever is separated by, by, by a space, right? The frequency of words, so the letter the in English, which appears many a time, et cetera, to the idiosyncratic that happens only once or whatever, something like that, you have a distribution. Why all books you can possibly analyze with a few exceptions well understood, like, um, by the way, yeah. 
train spotting, for instance, because of a sketchiness of a language of a of a uh, uh, low income Manchester suburbs that was a subject of a thing, etc., was so schematic, or the distribution of a text messages that the young guys send themselves. They are abbreviated, simplified. They are not affined to the, uh, to the others. But in any book, but regardless of the language, regardless of the age, regardless of the subject of the book, you have the same distribution. Does it mean that there is a, a, a goddess that uh, uh, adjusts the many, the, the thousands of thoughts that the guy who writes the book uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, actually to, to make a distribution look like that, or is it more reasonable to assume that this is inevitable? I think the second is absolutely obvious to me. And that's self-organized and self-organized critical because it's a power law. Self-organization means that regardless of a uh, minute difference, we can have majestic different initial conditions, majestic differences regardless of the values of the parameter of a dynamic process, whatever you have it, you're gonna have the same outcome. Not perfectly diverse for minute differences, but the same outcome for widely different conditions, dynamic and initial. And the signature of SOC, of self-organized criticality, is the emergence of that scale invariance, meaning something which you coarse grain at uh, different scales and the distribution of the power law is the only distribution which is invariant uh, 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 under coarse grain it is over averaging of the different sizes. So we have tools for, not for evaluating, I know if you talk to a statistician, they always kind of blah, whatever, statistical testing, of course, et cetera. But symptoms are symptoms. Symptoms is not the disease. I mean, as it was famously said, I mean, you can't define pornography, right? But you have to say for the symptoms, you know what you're talking about. Turbulence is the same, it was the example was used for turbulence in fact. And it's the same for many phenomena. Simple measures, simple tricks to, as Suyan was asking, if you make the scaling, for instance, uh, or what happens to it once you average over different windows or different sizes, whether it's diverging with the number of sizes, is the signature of that feature. Once you have those, uh, those uh, uh, footprints, then you know that something of the same kind is happening. So in a sense, you have a way, an early symptom of whether you be leading to something. And in terms of inequalities, well, the distribution of richness tends, uh, I mean, in irresistibly towards a power law. And towards a power law in which 80% of the wealth is in the hands of a 20% of the rich, a fraction, 20% uh, fraction of the population, which is the richest. And this is disturbing in my view. A proper distribution, a distributional policy, in fact, is something we should be aiming, et cetera. And once you know, you can perhaps find some corrections, hopefully. That's my five cents. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm just touching so many things, and but it's good to see you, Stefano. Where are you? Where are you? Your old friends are online. Mark Miller wants to ask you. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> look at that. Hey, Andrea. Hello, Mark. Good, good to, to see, see you, so Mark. Many, so friend. many people, so many note people. <laughs> From so Notre I'm, Dame. Hopefully, yeah, right. for, hopefully not for long. I shouldn't say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, I, I'm, I, I really love your talk as, as usual. And I was particularly intrigued by the, um, the connection that you pointed out between the power law exponents and inequality. And it never occurred to me, but it's, you know, it makes sense thinking about it. And I apologize in advance if my question is simplistic. My brain is a bit fried uh, after listening to you for an hour. But since, since uh, you know, parallel behavior is a signature of self-organized criticality and the value of the exponents is a description of inequality, um, do you have any thought on how, on the relation that this suggests between inequality and resilience? Like, does it mean that a system that is more unequal defined as a parallel is also more or less resilient? Oh, no, Mario, this is a very deep question, actually. All I'm saying is that, well, now, uh, if you were capable of finding a very well-defined, uniquely defined exponent, then it would be a measure of resilience. I'm afraid that noisy data and the size of data that are required to make it a really smooth thing, et cetera, typically uh, you won't have. So it's, uh, in, in principle, the answer is yes. But I think that a clean cut distinction with especially with resilience which is a higher level concept 
so complicated that um, it could be kind of impeded by the features of a of the data. But certainly, I mean, you went, you're a great GIS guy, etc. So the kind of size of data, in fact, that you can characterize, of course, they have to be homogeneous. Sure enough, I mean, let's not exaggerate on what uh, we not. It's not. I, I, of course, I am exaggerating. Of course. But it's the sense of direction. If we were capable of having homogeneous, um, homogeneous in terms of the statistical properties, features, and you're going to have big data indeed. So then the answer is yes, you can. Yeah. So which direction does it even go? Because it, it's unintuitive to me whether a more equal system or a more unequal system is more, more resilient. But exponent and itself, in the exponent itself, uh, it, it's a good indicator of the resilience and a good indicator of the inequalities, as you've seen in the 80-20 rule, for instance. Uh, you have to be, all right, um, uh, you can't normalize the distribution if you're not, it has to be larger than one for sure. But then you have, you know, from the, uh, um, then you have in the infinite size limit, you have diverging second moment or third moment, et cetera, they depend on the, on the, on the value of the coefficient. So um, it has to be strong decay, that is two from two to three, you're gonna have uh, infinite variance and finite mean uh, in the infinite sample. Um, if you go from three to four and, and the likes, et cetera. But the idea is that once you face real data, then many factors pitch in. And what I'm advocating for is the so-called finite size effects, which are inevitable. Uh, the study of uh, road networks, which I I told the Manuel Estrano, the, the same the same uh, funny things I'll be telling you tonight. I told them in a, in a uh, at like 10 p.m. Uh, with this graduate student uh, Manuel Estrano was passing by. I was saying you you should do this etc. And the guy got enthused, and as a result, <laughs> I mean six months afterwards, uh, the guy I mean diverted the sizable part of his thesis, which was actually in GIS with Francois Gollet. Uh, uh, so the technical capabilities, and that's a message, especially for the produce students of, for engineers. This is a great opportunity for engineers. Why? Because we need to be technologically savvy. We need to. We have an advantage that what I want to say. I, I mean, I've been, um, uh, I've been working of my my. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, uh, we published a paper on COVID nineteen spread in Italy in PNAS in in uh, less than a year ago. It, it came out at the end of April, etc. It has five hundred citations by now. Of course, the size of a problem. Some people said, well, what the, hell do, what the hell do you know about that? Well, what I'm saying is that I keep telling it the few times I've been interviewed, I said, look, what is absolutely clear to me is the spread of an infection. It's not a problem for doctors. It's not a problem for epidemiologists. It's not a problem for virologists. It's a problem for engineers, whoever you like or not, because you have to trace like Satish does so wonderfully well, where the hell people go and where the hell people go back. Now you go to a place, you get a probability of contact and you bring back the disease or your asymptomatic uh, infectious guy, you go into a place and you spread the disease itself. The tracking problem, which is embedded in the wonderful work, for instance, that Satish is doing, that is human mobility network, it, it's where the infection goes. I mean, it doesn't take a, it's not mind boggling, right? And it's for us. It's a good opportunity for us. It's not for virologists or medical doctors, et cetera. So, so, with the doctors, et cetera. You have a doctor, but you have no idea on how an infection spread. Of course, you know how the infection operates on you, but that's not predicting large scale patterns of infections. I, I'm not very popular with the faculty of medicine here, I'm afraid. <laughs> Andrea, I apologize. I have to end the formal part of this seminar. We're about 10 minutes over the. I'm so sorry. No, I no, no, no. So you I was going to say that. thank you everybody who logged in to listen to Andrea today. If you want to log off, I uh, will end the formal part of the lecture and few of us will stay on to carry forward the conversation with Andrea. So thank you very much. If you would log